Lost media is a term used to describe film, audio, and literature that has become inaccessible to the public. Over the years, it's garnered a lot of attention from readers and outlets alike. Fanatics have likened its popularity to the Streisand effect. The inability to access something makes people want it more. But every now and again, there are projects that even enthusiasts think are better left lost. And as silly as it sounds, such is the case for us with the children's film Freaky Flickers, The Quest for the Golden Flicker. No, this isn't an exaggeration. Based on the toy line by the same name, the production of the Freaky Flickers film is unbelievably tragic. When we first began researching this case, we had no idea what we were getting into. If you're unfamiliar with who we are, well, my name is Austin. I'm a regular narrator and co-writer of the Animation Warehouse. It's an independently produced web series that discusses lost media along with animation in general. We were first informed about this project when a fan requested we do an episode about it. The project had gained some notoriety for its odd similarities to the film Food Fight, with both films getting lost due to hard drive thievery. We were only able to find two scenes from the film, along with a plot synopsis. Some scientists by the name of Doc Flick imbues these plastic things with personalities and abilities so that they can help them around the lab. However, Doc Flick hasn't been making his mortgage payments, and the IRS are on his tail, so the Flickers go off on an adventure to find the Golden Flicker so they can help pay off the Doc's debt. We started off our expedition in August with the discovery of the lead animator's public meltdown. The story, as he told it, began in 2005 with the creation of the toys by the brothers Simon and Walter Bombach. These names have been changed. They were produced in collaboration with Toys 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 Inc., who sculpted and painted the collectibles. Carrie Howe, an employee for the latter, had heard that Simon was interested in funding a TV adaptation, so he began working on a pitch. After amassing nearly six to seven months of work on the pilot, his idea was approved. Kerry decided to animate the film using Lightwave and produce the models using Moto. At the beginning of production, Kerry was tasked using a 3200 Athlon shuttle box. Its weak processing power plagued production with issues. By the third year, they had only rendered three minutes of animation. As time went on, Kerry would run through a number of PCs. From Kerry's own words, he only began to make real progress once he accumulated a merry band of computers. He paid for them out of his own pocket and worked from home. In May of 2007, Carrie proposed the project be changed from a TV series into a 90-minute film. Although it took some convincing, he and Simon eventually came to an agreement. Once it was released, they would divide the proceeds from the film's revenue and merchandise. In September, Carrie finished the film's script, signaling for the remaining voiceovers to be recorded. Tight budgeting caused recording sessions to become a nightmare. They typically ran only one to two hours per actor leading to what Carey dubbed speed directing. In January of 2009, the project received an influx of attention due to a new trailer Carey had released on his website. Simon managed to score a few business meetings out of this new spotlight. Afterwards, he recommended Carey turn the project into a theatrical feature. I was extremely hesitant and pointed out that it was easily four times the work and we needed drastically more equipment and actual workstations. I got approval based on dynamic budget, half of which never materialized. Once it was decided, they were offered an incredible deal by MGM. The deal included a release in over 2,800 theaters, so long as Simon provided the P&A money. This money would account for the advertisement budget and projection copies. To help edit the film and manage the sound, Carrie brought an old friend onto the project. We'll call him Eric Wessel. Every day, Carrie reworked around one to two minutes of the film. This included animating, lighting, and rendering. This had been a major concern to me from the beginning. The amount they wanted was roughly 100 times what our film's entire budget was. Today, we haven't passed the $250,000 spent on actual production. That includes actors, hardware, software, and the entire payroll. I was nervous, but constantly assured it wasn't a problem. This was when things began falling apart. Carrie was extremely stressed out due to the P&A deadline, and despite professional level equipment, he was still being slugged with hardware problems. At the end of the first week in June, Carrie's workstation began crashing during test renders. Because it was his only 64-bit machine, he was forced to continue using it. As the weekend approached, Carrie decided to continue working overnight. He was so exhausted by the end, they decided to rest in spite of the imminent deadline. It was then that the film was stolen. I said goodnight to Mr. Wuzzle, who was editing the film in my living room. I woke a little before 8 p.m. I noticed it was too quiet. The project computers were gone, as were the backup drives and Mr. Wuzzle. 
I noticed a letter taped to the wall from Mr. Bambach, explaining that the P&A money had fallen through. He was shutting down the film. I collapsed into a chair and was unable to rise for many hours. Again, unless otherwise noted, all of Carrie's quotes are sourced from the multi-paragraph rant he released after being robbed. I felt violated and in shock. One of my closest friends, Mr. Wessel, had apparently turned on me and let my associate take the equipment and files while I slept. He had disappeared back to his home in Martha's Vineyard, and to this day has yet to respond to any of my phone calls or emails. I had known him for 15 years, and I paid his way to come out for the job. Him turning Judas was as hard as a blow as losing everything. When we first read through the text, we got the impression that something was off about Carrie. And we're not alone in this observation. The way he presented himself has caused many to suggest that he suffers from mental illness. We don't believe this is the case for reasons we'll explore later. Regardless, the cliffhanger Carrie had written compelled us to look deeper. And our first step was searching for disparities. So, we did some digging. Firstly, Carrie glosses over the project's original trailer. While it's tough to say whether or not this had been done intentionally, its absence is rather convenient. See, on July 8, 2008, Cartoon Brew published an article mocking the film for desperately seeking distribution. This included a line sarcastically suggesting readers watch the trailer. The article predates the second trailer. This article had to have been on Carrie's radar for a multitude of reasons. For one, Simon had actually left messages in the article's comment section. And keep in mind, Cartoon Brew has very strict guidelines for commenters, meaning these were likely the real deal. The following is a comment believed to have been left by All of the emotion and reaction this film is generating from you all, I would bet this is going to be a big hit. When it is a big hit, you guys can reminisce this moment when you discovered it when no one else knew about it. Isn't that sweet? It's like the girl you picked on in school because you secretly loved her. Remember when you were in first grade but pretended she had cooties because you were afraid to show your real feelings? You don't want to admit you like her because your super cool friends don't want to admit they also have a crush on her. Come on guys, you spent all day researching this movie and posting on this blog and it sounds like you watched every second of the trailer. It sounds like love to me. I'd love to see some of your animation, if you have any, and see how great it is. That isn't where the oddities end either. Well, we could visit the article the week it had been published, Simon waited a full year to comment. In fact, Simon's comment was posted a month after Cartoon Brew's coverage of the theft. And in case there's still any doubt that the article had reached Carrie, shortly after Cartoon Brew published its first article, the Freaky Flickers website temporarily shut down. One thing we noticed while sifting through the comments was that Simon had claimed that no one had broken into Carrie's home. No one forced their way into anyone's home, and who paid for all the equipment I took back? If someone came in your house and took your equipment and files, wouldn't you call the police? We would eventually find an answer to his question, but we'll address this later. The second disparity was that the film had stayed in production after being stolen. If you recall, Carrie claims that the project had been cancelled after missing the P&A deadline. Well, if Simon is in the comments talking about new footage, this couldn't have been the case. In fact, Carrie himself would learn the truth later on. While piecing together the timeline, we decided to look through Carrie's postings online for more information. There, we learned that in 2010 he had created a website titled Freaky Flickers, The Untold Story. Though it's now dysfunctional, we were able to access it using online archiving websites. On this site was a leaked letter from Eric. In it, Eric reveals that the film had a budget of $1.5 to $3 million. Eric also name drops the production company they had begun working with. It had been formed only four months prior to the theft, by Simon and one of Eric's colleagues. From the very start, we had been somewhat skeptical of Carrie. But after finding these discrepancies, it felt like our suspicions about him had been confirmed. So, we were essentially back at square one, except with an additional question. What had happened to the $3 million budget Wessel had boasted about? After digging a bit deeper, we found another lead. While reviewing the concept art sheets for the film, we realized that many of them had been approved after Carrie's removal. This suggests that Simon had hired a new artist to take his place. In hopes of finding someone willing to speak, we began searching for people who had worked for the film's production company. We ended up interviewing multiple freelance artists over text. We will not be identifying them by name, due to privacy concerns. We were told that once Carrie had been removed, Simon hired a team of five freelancers to pick up where production had left off. Aside from a few interns and the team manager, the artists worked from remote locations. Their efforts led from the film looking like this, to this. 
which is a pretty big jump in quality. The production was meant to be a three-month gig and was advertised on sites like Craigslist. It was to end in December with the completion of the film. They were expected to complete five to seven seconds of animation a day and would be paid $800 a week. The animation quota would slowly increase over time. The team was tasked with converting carry scenes and characters from Lightwave to Maya. This conversion caused many of the rigs to boast limited functionality. The characters often had to be reweighted just to become usable. Some scenes had to be reanimated entirely based on dialogue alone. Contact between the artists was slim to none. Typically, they would only interact with Simon and Eric. Once they completed their quota, they would upload their work to a shared Dropbox. Most of them were oblivious to the film's history. One even told us they had never even heard the name Carrie Howe. Before Christmas, the animators were given a break so Simon could search for further funding. When production resumed in January, Simon and Eric allegedly began missing their payments to the animators. One even claimed that they were threatened with pay reductions and being fired. Our sources believe that production ended in March due to either lack of funding or artists leaving due to abusive management tactics. Only two known employees have claimed to continue working on the project past April of 2010. However, both state they had left production in 2011. Given the circumstances, it seemed to us that MGM had decided to pull the plug, explaining its sudden halt in production. While the only scene released was a massive improvement over the original, nothing about it screamed theatrical worthy. Well, in a later revision of the homepage, he reveals that Simon hadn't actually taken up the MGM deal. According to Kerry, he wanted its release to coincide with the toys. After a few weeks, I noticed that Simon stopped talking about finding the prints and advertising money. We had one offer, but he wasn't happy with the percentages. The difference was 2%, so I said, take it out of my cut, let's just get the film released. It was around that time that he took a trip to Canada to discuss relaunching the toys with the help of the toy company. He said it was also a meeting with a possible backer for the P&A money. When he got back in town, he was rambling about his new toy deal, but there was no mention of the backer. That's when I realized he decided to run out the clock on the P&A money so he could release the film when he wanted. This means that all of Simon's payments were likely coming out of his own pocket. This led us to answering the second question. What happened to the $3 million budget? Well, Carrie also details several times Simon had lied to him about the money he didn't have. Finally, in early 2009, Simon began to meet contacts in Hollywood that kept asking why we didn't increase the quality to theatrical resolution. I resisted it at first, given that it was nearly impossible with the equipment we had on hand. I told him it would take 100 grand minimum to up the quality. He claimed he had it on hand. A couple of days later, he admitted he had no money, but was sure he could raise it. He even provides an explanation for why the artist stopped getting paid. During the time frame, Simon was supposed to pay Carrie for the sale of the film's rights. He stopped in early 2010, claiming he was in poverty. After many months, I offered to reduce the payments. By this point, I felt it was going to be the only way I'd ever get paid what he owed me. He still couldn't make payments on time, and after a month and a half, they stopped entirely. He constantly promised payments, but they never arrived. Eric had likely been fed into the deal, under the assumption that Simon had sealed the funds. Back on the Untold Story website, Carrie also revealed why Simon stole it when he did. Carrie had gone broke, and the rental house he'd lived in was being sold, forcing Carrie to move out. So, Carrie made a deal with Simon. He'd work on the film until moving to Maine, so long as Simon continued searching for the P&A money. Simon likely stole it back to take that bargaining power out of Carrie's hands. With few options of fighting back, Kerry used what little money he had to purchase a cheap notebook computer. He used the device to make the sights and spread his tail. In an effort to calm him, Simon offered to buy him out of the film. Because Kerry had gone bankrupt handling the project's electric and utility bills, he agreed. He took his first payment and left for Maine. As Kerry began to resettle, Simon visited a legal consultant in hopes of maintaining control over the film. With the help of Mr. Weisberger, he penned a letter to Carey threatening legal action. He demanded Carey stop telling people what they had done, and then stated that he would not be honoring their contracts. I pointed out that it's hard to threaten someone once you've taken everything from them, and that I never once agreed to a gag order or to not show my work. Once again, I find it odd that a corporate lawyer would be so unwilling to honor contracts, yet hide behind them. I'm thrilled to honor all our agreements, but I seem to be the only one. Apparently, the contracts weren't worth the paper they were written on. This is not slander, it's a fact. Kerry was forced to abandon his new home and move back to Arizona so he could pursue legal action. He was taking Simon's Corporation to court for breaching their contracts. 
Unfortunately, the exact proceedings of the case are unknown. It ended in arbitration, meaning it was resolved out of court and made confidential. Still, Kerry told us that he was never found at fault. I don't know what I can say legally. I don't want to stir that mess back up again. All I can say is that I was never found to be at fault, and that Simon never honored a single agreement. We had always called it a partnership, but I found in the contracts that I was reduced to a work for hire. I told the lawyer this wasn't the case, but they insisted. The hard fact is that civil law is based on lawyers for enforcement, and they know it. Translated contracts are worthless, unless you can enforce them with lawyers. His whole position was, they own the film, and I have no rights. Since there was no way to enforce the contracts, I guess he was right. On November 15th, we attempted to get in contact with Simon. We hoped they would tell us his side of the story. Sadly, we didn't have the foresight to ask him to sign a personal release form. As a result, we are unfortunately unable to play the actual audio of the interview. But let it be known, it is on recording. And lo and behold, there are some pretty big differences between his and Carrie's accounts. Full disclosure, this interview took place before we discovered the later revision of the untold story. According to Simon, the film had to be pulled from Carrie for a number of reasons. One of these was laziness. Simon alleges that Carrie had only met his two-minute quota by putting less and less effort into the animation. In fact, sometimes in order to get action into a scene, he'd simply shake the camera a bit. But the main reason he cited was much more tragic. Simon revealed to us that during production, Carrie's father had passed away and that Carrie was so devastated by this, they began to deteriorate mentally. He asserted that Carrie had had a midlife crisis, and felt the need to push the film out as a personal accomplishment. Astonishingly, Simon laughs immediately after disclosing Carrie had had a midlife crisis. For better or for worse, we were able to verify that Carrie's father had passed away during production. When we asked Simon about the film, he surprised us by claiming that it was still in production. In fact, he said it was about 60-70% to 70 finished, and that it was going to be released next year. He also said that to coincide with the film, he would re-release the toy line. But if this is to all be believed, one has to wonder why the film continued to stay in developmental hell for over 7 years without any public acknowledgement. Not only that, but every single known employee of the film's production company claims on their resumes that they had left the film by 2012. This includes Eric, who Simon told us was still editing the film. To put it bluntly, Simon was probably lying. We believe they realized that our video would be a great way to get interest back into the project and make a profit. So we tried to get us to report on the film optimistically. Note how he claims that he would re-release the toys. This will be important very soon. While we had previously been reluctant to contact Carrie, now it seemed necessary. When we first emailed Carrie Howe, we told him about how we had already interviewed Simon and now we wanted to hear his side. He responded by telling us that we had brought back all the painful memories and sleepless nights from that period of his life. He did eventually agree to the interview though. He was upset that Simon had been talking about him behind his back. He lies about a lot of things. He talks big, but it's mostly him by himself. He liked the film because it made the company look bigger than a guy working out of his house. But he's a control freak, and it was all about ego. It was important to him that the toys made the film a success and not that the film made the toys successful. The toys were a flop, so he wanted to stay on the film until the toys were a success. That was ultimately what killed the film. When we told him that we first suspected Simon had been lying to us, he responded, If you have any questions on specifics you think he's lying about, feel free to ask. I have no reason to lie. The truth is ugly enough on its own. In regards to if he was lying, he preemptively responded, the big difference between our positions is that I can back up what I say with contracts and emails. If Carrie had been lying to us, he'd be accounting for very minute details. Minute details that we never brought up to him. Remember when Simon claimed he'd never broken into Carrie's house? Carrie addresses that in the email. At first they claimed that Simon had never entered the house, and that Eric Wessel handed the stuff to him over the threshold. Then a couple of years later, Eric Wessel got cold feet and they changed their story so that Eric never touched anything. I guess he was afraid I'd come after him legally. So, we found our answer. The film wasn't completed because Simon had decided to hold on to it in the hopes of eventual profit with the toys. And given how slimy production was, maybe it's for the best that the film never gets funded. With all these allegations, paying for the film would essentially be funding the abusive artists, be it Carrie Howe or the freelancers. 
For a while, this project killed Carrie's drive to produce films. You may not believe it, but Carrie's work outside of Freaky Flickers is genuinely impressive. Hell, he worked on The Lord of the Rings as a mini set designer. Now, I'm not denying that Freaky Flickers looks bad. But what we're getting at is that his talent shines when he works closer to reality. Freaky Flickers was out of his comfort zone. The film had also had long-lasting effect on Carrie's personal life. Carrie had invested all of his money to keeping the project alive. And if we're to go by Simon's word about Carrie's father, his obsession was motivated by loss. He was going through a midlife crisis and wanted to prove his self-worth. And if all that wasn't bad enough, Carrie also lost a friend of 15 years to greed. I was smart enough to not give my partner access to the film, but I trusted an old friend that stabbed me in the back for a directing credit. Eric didn't just turn a blind eye to Simon's wrongdoing. He also began selling Carrie's old scripts without permission. Carrie was able to expose this by posing as someone else by using a fake email. It's been over seven years since the film was first slated for a release. At the time, the injustice against Carrie Howe went under the radar. And to date, Carrie has yet to recover financially. I hope her coverage of the story can, at the very least, help rebuild his reputation as an artist. Just remember the old X-Files quote, Trust no one. I only trusted one person, but that trust cost me everything.